this is why that's on the meeting of the committee on outreach communications and appointments it's friday december 20th and seeing the presence of a quorum i'm calling the meeting to order at 11:03 a.m uh, we are expecting councillor brewer to show up late and councillor schwartz will be absent uh, so you have in your packet a number of items. You have an agenda that was revised a few days ago. I'm also going to revise it again during this meeting, um, which I'll discuss. But the first thing I want to do is we, uh, our last meeting on December 9th, adopted our uh, new process that we are going to be implementing to recommend to the town council appointments to multiple member bodies appointed by the town council. Um, we adopted this on Monday, December 9th, and then it was a, a discussion item on the town council agenda on the 16th. Uh, we had already received feedback from many councillors in advance, uh, which we discussed at our last meeting, but there were some who either uh, forgot or uh, for other reasons did not submit feedback um, that we had not heard from. And so what I want to do for the first five to ten minutes of this meeting is just talk about the feedback that we heard from the council um, and then we've already adopted the process um, and that wasn't and we incorporated some feedback from some counselors um, but the question of course becomes based on any feedback that we heard uh, do we want to reconsider any aspect of the process? Um, so it's adopted, but we can also, of course, amend the adopted process um, if we felt like we heard feedback that would warrant us to do so. Um, so I have my own thoughts on what was said during the meeting, but I want to sort of open up uh, to the other committee members first to just say, you know, what were your thoughts of the discussion? What were your impressions? Well, you were at the meeting. Well, I, don't, I mean, I have I have like handwritten notes from the meeting, but well, maybe you can spell it out because I think we both see I don't have notes. Okay. And while I was at the meeting, I don't have the call. Right <laughs> that meeting went five and a half hours. Is that it right? was a lengthy meeting. So um, it would help maybe for you to take us through um, sure. the comments if that would be helpful for both of us. So the main the main comments centered around uh, group interviews, right. um, and we got conflicting feedback from the council. Um, so Councillor Shane and Councillor Pam um, sort of expressed some reservations about these group interviews. Um, on the other hand, uh, Councillor Steinberg and Councillor DeAngelis expressed support for the group interviews. Um, and so we got some mixed feedback on, on group interviews about uh, how they might impact the, de the, the debate. Uh, we heard also some comments about uh, whether or not we would actually uh, withdraw someone from the pool if they could not make the interview date. Uh, that was a concern of Councillor Shane. Um, that was also a concern of Councillor Schreiber, um, who was also someone who supported the group interviews, but felt as though um, someone should be able to still be considered part of the pool even if they uh, missed the group interview date. Uh, we also heard some comments about um, uh, community activity forms. Uh, certainly, Councillor uh, Pam expressed an interest that she had in her, her feedback uh, previously to make community activity forms public. Um, we heard from other councillors, such as Councillor Ball Milne and Councillor Haneke, uh, support of maintaining the policy of uh, keeping the CAFs as personnel records. And I think I think that was the main, those are my main notes. We heard from Councillor DeAngelis that the process gave her uh, the, the two things that she wanted to see, which was an ability to see who applied who, and to see the CAFs um, and an ability to see the interviews. And so she was quite happy with the uh, process. Um, I think those are all of the notes I have of the feedback. Darcy. Pat did also say that she agreed that the CAFs should be made public, but something about 
that we could do that in the future or something like that. George? Setting the CAF issue aside for a moment, the other concerns, I think, are concerns that we've all expressed and talked about at some length, and I don't think we saw any way to resolve them um, other than completely undoing the entire process. So I think at least I share some of the concerns about people being knocked out of the process just because they can't meet this one date. Um, but I don't see any way to, for us to solve that. If we were to allow for some kind of exception, we're back to the situation where now we have you know, people being interviewed under two very different processes. And we felt that was really not fair. Um, so um, what was the other? So the, the one was people being knocked out. And then the group interview. And then the whole idea of group interview, which we, we, no, nobody of us, I don't think any of us are happy with that. Um, I think, well, I should speak for myself. Um, I would much prefer individual interviews. Um, but that seems to be simply not possible. Um, so uh, given that this seems to be the best of all worst options, um, I hear the concerns. I share at least two of them. Um, but I don't see any way that we can do anything to um, resolve them. I think we're just going to have to try this process and see how it goes. It was encouraging to hear Andy Steinberg speak about how this has worked in the past. That was encouraging to hear. And if Alyssa were here, perhaps she would add some thoughts to that as well, hopefully in agreement with <laughs> Andy. I don't know. But um, I guess that's my feeling that um, I hear those concerns, but I don't see what we can do to resolve them. I don't know what Darcy thinks there's anything we could do to, other than the CAFs, which I think is a different issue. Darcy. Uh, we could just take, take out the one sentence that says um, that. Uh, something about if a person isn't available that day, they're excluded from the process. It's just to allow us some flexibility. I think that opens up the question, though, then what, what does that flexibility mean? Do we hold an interview for one person on a separate day? So everyone interviews as a group except one person. I think I think we this could divide it into two two groups or something like that. I mean, we, it seems like we need to have flexibility um, you, of some sort, and that just might be the price we'd have to pay for, you know, just being a little bit flexible. You know, I think one of the things that I keep coming back to on on this, because I and you know, I, I share these concerns as well. Um, and I think to some extent we have to see what the practical application of this looks like because we've been talking a lot um, conceptually. Um, and one thing I will say is so I have begun the process now that, the pro now that our process has been adopted, I've begun the process of reaching out to everyone who submitted a community activity form um, to confirm if they are still interested. Um, and as part of my uh, outreach to those people, I have floated a potential interview date um, to them, and so far every person who I've heard back from has confirmed that that date works for them, um, but I also have several other dates in my back pocket that if that didn't work, I could default to. And so part of me feels at this time, let's just see if it works, because if we're able, it might be, it might be a barrier that we think exists that doesn't actually exist if it's impossible to find a date that works for all candidates, and maybe, maybe it is, um, but I think we, to some extent, I, I'm sort of leaning towards let's not open up the process and let's see if it actually works. And if I come back to you all at the next meeting and say, there is no date that works for everyone, then maybe that's a time to have a conversation of, okay, so maybe that, maybe that doesn't work. What's the date? The date I've been floating to people is January 22nd. Whether or not that is the date requires a whole bunch of things that we will talk about later in the meeting, um, but just to sort of put feelers out there on a date, that's the date I've been using. It seems important to get, make sure that the members of this committee are available on whatever date you're putting forward. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just important that we be fair, and um, I hear Darcy's point about flexibility, and I think in the best of all possible worlds, that's what we would, we would do, I think, in many other contexts, but we're not in those kinds of contexts. We're in a very 
public and official context and uh, will be scrutinized every which way to Sunday. And I think if we start getting into, you know, a perfectly understandable desire for flexibility, we become vulnerable to criticisms of favoritism and, well, so-and-so gets special treatment. And um, even though that's almost very likely never going to be the case, it's perception that matters. It's not the reality. And uh, so I think whatever process we follow, however painful it may be, it has to be applicable to everybody. And uh, I think that's where we're, we're at. So my general takeaways were um, thinking in terms of, is there any reason to reconsider any aspect of the process um, or vote to amend any part of the process? Um, I went into the meeting thinking if I heard uh, a large or even just a majority of counselors take issue with any particular part of the process, uh, that would be reason to perhaps reconsider. Um, given that the, the debate really focused around two things and there didn't seem to be any unanimous opinion on those things, uh, I personally feel no desire or reason to attempt to amend what we adopted at our last meeting or reconsider any aspect of that, um, but I'd be willing to entertain um, other ideas or, or, or in theory also motions to do so. Or do we want to just say, we've heard the feedback, or let's move on, let's move forward. George. That's my sentiment. I, I hear what people are saying. Um, I sympathize with a good portion of it, but I don't see any reason or any way really we can amend the process to resolve these issues um, and I think we need to move forward. Okay. Darcy. I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued with I'm the not sure if your mic is on. I'm intrigued with the process of uh, committees getting input from other counselors because it's not clear how that works or what would trigger a change? Um, you know, I'm going through the same thing with the goals committee. Mm -hmm. That the goals committee is reaching out to counselors to get their opinions, and you know, occasionally one counselor's opinion will change the, you know, the. It's it just just unclear to me, like how it works, how, how, how getting input from the rest of the council can sway the group. Um, just making a comment, um, because it seems like in some contexts, you know, one counselor's opinion can amend a document, but in other situations, three counselors can make a comment but it doesn't make a difference. So why would that be? I don't know. Just making a comment. I, <laughs> as, as someone who teaches feedback and revision quite a bit in this class, I mean, I think the idea of soliciting feedback is uh, for, for, for one is you want to sort of get broader input um, and then two, sometimes you become so close to the subject matter you're working with that you don't see issues or flaws and you need other people to point them out to you. Then when feedback comes in, of course, and I think what we did was we said, well, let's look at it. And you don't take all feedback, you take some feedback and, and really feedback is a discussion starter. And so uh, for, for us, some of the feedback was stuff that we had really spent hours and hours debating and thought, you know what? We have thoroughly dealt with that, and so we're going to respectfully uh, decline that feedback. Oh, I don't think that's true. Because it has taken us many, many hours considering it. Anyway, it's just a comment. Because I think the other, the other thing, if I can speak, is uh, you know what we did hear from Andy was that he pointed out that we had mentioned videotaping nowhere in the in the process, right? And that was a place where the feedback was really useful because it pointed out an omission. And then we amended our process. So I think it's it's just an, it's just about influencing that discussion and and making sure that you're getting you're catching all of those things. But 
I mean, I think it's by committee by committee. And now had we heard from 10 counselors that they hated one aspect of this, we probably would change it, that would, right? Um, so, I, you know, I think that's just, that's just a generally um, feedback. So it sounds like we're moving forward. Um, and so I want, I mean, I wish the full committee yeah. was here at this moment, um, but I do want to thank both of you and also Alyssa and Sarah because this was, uh, again, eight two plus hour meetings of work that we put into getting us to where we are today. Um, here she is. I am thanking the committee now that we are moving on from our process for, for you know, all of the work that all of you put in because this was not necessarily something that was easy um, and it was something that was a big task before us that I think a lot of us knew we'd have to grapple with and uh, it feels good to have completed it. So thank you all of you for all of your help in putting this together. Um, and and we'll, <laughs> any, well, we'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll see how it works um, in January. So looking at our agenda, item number four on our agenda, the next item is discussion and vote on sufficiency of planning board applicant pool. So as you all remember, uh, section three of our, um, of our process that we adopted uh, says that we have to declare the, act, uh, the applicant pool uh, by majority vote, OCA shall declare the applicant pool sufficient to proceed to interviews. And so this is a step we have to do in order to actually hold interviews, we need to declare that the pool is sufficient. Um, because I think there is a desire within this committee, within the council, and certainly within the community to get a member of the planning board appointed, uh, my hope was that we could have that discussion and potentially vote today on the sufficiency of the applicant pool. Um, so that we could start moving forward um, with interviews. That said, I am going to table that discussion for now um, for, for two reasons. One is that I have reached out to every person for whom I have a CAF to ask if they um, are still interested. I have not received a response from all of them. And so I don't know truly what the applicant pool looks like. I have heard back from some people who have confirmed they're still interested, and I have heard from some people who have withdrawn their CAF. Mm -hmm. And so given that I haven't heard back from everyone, uh, we don't really know what the pool is. Beyond that, I am also waiting on, technically, uh, per our policy that we adopted, we, we collect CAFs for the past two years. Uh, I, to the best of my knowledge, only have CAFs from the past year. And so I have put in a request to Angela to provide me um, with a list of all of the CAFs over the past two years, but I have not yet received that. She is working on it, we talked this morning, um, but I don't have that yet. And so because I haven't heard back from everyone who I've contacted, and because I'm not sure I've contacted everyone who we should be contacting, I don't necessarily feel like we are ready to have a discussion and vote on the sufficiency of the applicant pool. Uh, I also would want to bring you all some documents that we could look at and have a full discussion. Um, and because I was waiting on all of these things, I don't have those documents. So I don't think that this is an appropriate time to do so. So I am going to table that discussion until our uh, well, we haven't had the discussion about our January committee meeting schedule that comes towards the end, but I have tentatively put a meeting on January 6th, and that would be when we would have that discussion. So, is there no, uh, George? Well, I, when you table something, this is just rules of procedure. Is it something we can talk about, or is this? Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to, to hear well, I'm just a question for the committee as a whole. When, when in fact, is uh, the time right? It seems like it's never going to be the right, perfect time. There's always going to be things still out there in the ozone that uh, we're waiting to hear from X, Y, and Z, blah, 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 blah. Um, it seems, I, do people have this problem or not? That, that it, it probably, in some sense, we should be the ones who determine, you know, we want to we go forward with interviews 
Um, so we look at the pool and see what it's like. And yes, there may still be people out there we haven't heard from. Yes, there may still be something that Angela's looking into. But um, should we let that drive the process or should we be driving it? And we say, OK, um, we're ready to do interviews. There's, uh, first of all, there's a vacancy. Um, time is of the essence. Um, we don't want to delay too much. Um, so we just take the pool as it is and uh, decide whether it's suitable or not. And I assume that also means that things can still come in later. So that once, again, this is just a question of process, once we determine that the pool is sufficient, that doesn't mean that there can't still be further uh, applicants accepted, um, which also raises the question of when is that process, when do we finally say no more applicants? So I guess I have some practical questions, first of all, that maybe have simple answers. Um, when actually is the applicant process declared? You know, if somebody comes in after X date, it's just not going to be considered? Or is it open until we actually have a discussion? I don't know. That's the first question. Second is, um, should we be driving this process or should it be driven by, you know, when people feel like they want to get back to us? Right. I think, I think the answer to the, what was your first question, but then you also listed as your second question about uh, do we decide? I think it is the committee's decision. And I think, but, and I think there will always perhaps be unknowns. There will always be people who maybe we haven't heard back from. And at some point we just have to say, we're moving forward. Uh, however, my opinion is at this moment, we, we don't have sufficient information on the pool to move forward. Um, and so while in the future it might be, well, we have X number of CAFs and we haven't heard uh, back from these two people, should we just wait until we hear back? The answer will probably be no. But at this point, I, I personally don't have enough information to bring to you as a committee to feel as though we could have this discussion productively. If on January 6th we still haven't heard back from a couple people, we may choose to go forward anyway, but I think that will give me enough time to collect and put together and, and synthesize the information that we need for us to have a good discussion. I don't think we could have a d good discussion today. With regard to your, your second question, um, the drop dead date, uh, we've never discussed that, I don't think, um, but my, my thought has always been um, that 48 hours before the interview, but I'm willing to hear that if someone applies the week before the interviews and they can make that date, I have no issue with including them in the interviews. Um, to me, the posting of the interviews would posting. be the drop dead posting. date, but that is a personal opinion. It has never been discussed by this committee, so I am willing to hear from others. Darcy, I see you're ready to go. Uh, we would be getting um, a spreadsheet uh, similar to the one that we got from the town manager uh, with the listing of the applicants. Yes. Oh, sir. So we've never gotten a spreadsheet from the town manager with a listing of applicants for any of anything. Yes. We've gotten. I did for well, finance committee. That wasn't from the town manager, was it? It was from Angela or somebody who was arranging right. dates. So that's a completely different thing. Yes, she works for the town manager, but I just want to make it clear since it was misreported in a recent uh, blog posting that the town manager gives us certain information confidentially that he doesn't actually give us. I don't know why it was reported that way. So staff has provided us that spreadsheet in the past and should continue to because that was true under the old old form of government. So it, it, in fact, doesn't make sense to me that we don't have an ongoing spreadsheet that's updated, but um, it makes sense that Angela's working on that now as the executive assistant to the town manager with the information from when she set up interviews for us last time when she made the decision that the pool was sufficient. And now this time, you know, anybody Evans reached out to to find out more information about the um, so aside from just clarifying where that information comes from, that should definitely be ours and should not be problematic to obtain from staff because it never was in the past, is that um, we have to be very careful that we don't speak of numbers or of people associated with that. So we can see a spreadsheet that we can call personnel record and that we can be told you know, you see lines through or color codes or whatever it is that these people are no longer interested and these are people who didn't get back to us or, you know, however that spreadsheet's laid out. 
but we can't he sit here and say two people withdrew and six people are still interested, et cetera, because of the fact that we've been protecting them as personnel records up until this point. So we just need to be super cautious about that and it's something we've never really dealt with before because when we just said, oh, you person, you're assigned to go off and do interviews, right? They were the only person who really had the information at that point. So we're just gonna have to be thoughtful about the way we discuss it once we do <laughs> information. But you know, reflecting back to what George originally said, like Evan said, we actually don't know what the pool is right now because for all we know, none of those people are interested, well, except he said some still were. So we can't just say, let's just go with what we've got because we don't know what we've got yet. Yeah. And to speak just to, briefly to something that Alyssa said that I forgot to mention as one of the other reasons I'm tabling this discussion for today is because I, I think that there needs to be a little bit more thought about how to have a productive conversation about the sufficiency of the applicant pool while at the same time maintaining our policy of not releasing numbers or names. Um, we've never had to do that before because we pretty much let Angela decide that the pool was sufficient and start scheduling things now that we have taken that responsibility on um, given that we're bounded by the constraints of open meeting law um, it's a delicate walk to figure to, to figure out how we have a discussion about the sufficiency of a pool without talking about numbers or or names and so I, I, I personally don't feel com feel comfortable having that today because I haven't fully wrapped my head around how we're going to do that so we're going to move to agenda item. Yes, George. But, uh, but are we okay with the 48 hour? I mean, that does make so, sense to me, yeah. but um, I just want to have a sense of when is the drop dead date. And that seems like an, a reasonable way to look at it, that applicants can be considered on, up until the point in which it's officially posted. Um, and otherwise we would have to come up with some other uh, date or some other um, process. Um, I'm, I can live with that. I think that means that seems cleared. I don't know if we need to vote on it, but um, it's essentially going to be part of our process, I guess, that um, applicants up to 48 hours before uh, are still possible. Everybody okay with that? Alyssa? Yeah, I think we should definitely add it to our process because so much of this is built off previous processes, and in those previous processes there was a drop-dead deadline date to apply, and then you knew who the pool of people were that you were arranging a date for, right? And in fact, we said, we in fact told people when we announced the vacancy back in the olden days that they had to be at a meeting on such and such date in order to even apply. And so we are in a different headspace right now yep. with this at this point, and it might vary a little bit in the future, but I totally agree. If somebody you know contacts us like the day before 48 hours and says, oh man, I didn't realize yep. that this was happening, as long as whatever we've decided is necessary for writing sample slash biography slash whatever the nice phrase was that you used in our report um, can be provided, right, so that they're not separate from the other people and they can show up at the time that was already agreed upon by the other 10 people right. that are coming, then I don't have a problem with that. So I don't want to have a protracted discussion of this or, or a wordsmithing discussion. Is there consensus around the idea of adding a line to section three, sufficiency of the applicant pool of the process that basically says uh, OCA will continue to consider applicants for an interview uh, up to 48 hours, up, up to the posting of the interviews or something a lot of words we kind of have to something along those lines to clarify that even though we've declared the pool sufficient that doesn't mean that people can't continue to apply and be considered up until the interviews are posted the only cautionary note I want to strike is and that I wasn't sure we quite gra covered in our previous word thing so maybe you can add it in here is to make it clear that we don't screen people out Right. right. They screen themselves out because they they apply and then they read the handouts and they go, oh, that sounds boring. <laughs> or, or it turns right. out they can't meet Wednesday nights or, you know, whatever. But we interview everyone. So it yeah. isn't just that we're considering adding them. It's that we will accept okay. or, or some word like that that makes it clear that we don't screen anybody out because we, I believe, have always agreed that we will literally interview every single yeah. person who applies that fills out the paper. George, you had something? I think that's it. I, 
I just think I want to make sure that, that whatever you put in there is such that um, it's clear that you have to have done everything that needs to be done. It's not just a matter of saying, I'm interested, if, I mean, or is it? I mean, in other words, are there certain things that have to be done prior to that 48 hours? And um, if somebody does it at the last minute and they don't have time to do the other things, then they're not considered. So. Um, That's what I was trying to make. Okay. So, we, so would, we would offer them the opportunity to have to be an equal standing with right. the other people. Yeah. And, and if, if they, they don't, don't or can't. With that, then we'd say thank you, please accommodate. So I will, I will, if it's okay with the committee, bring in a draft language and motion just to amend this section um, next time to add that. Okay. So I want to move on then to what is the main item of discussion during today's meeting, which is discussion of town council liaisons. This is something that was referred to us by the town council uh, at our retreat, which was, I believe, in September. Um, and uh, because we've had other things on our plate, we haven't yet gotten to it. But liaisons are town council appointments. They are not presidential appointments. And because we recommend on town council appointments, uh, it is in our purview to recommend, uh, make recommendations on liaisons. Uh, the way that I think this was in originally envisioned was that we would actually be recommending the names of people to serve on as liaisons to which committee. However, given that we are entering um, in the near future potential shuffling around of committees and committee memberships, um, and people may uh, change their mind. Uh, the request from the president has been to hold off on actually recommending names, but to essentially come forward with which committees of the uh, which committees and or elected bodies we feel should have liaisons. So then, when the president polls for which uh, council standing committees people want to serve on, she could also poll on which uh, bodies people want to serve as liaisons to, and then this body, having received that information that's more current, can consider that. Um, so our task is not to talk about names of people, to not talk about who should be on what a liaison to what committee. Um, our task for today is simply to come uh, to agreement on a recommendation to the council about which committee should have liaisons. There are a number of things in your packet around this, so I just want to run through them. The first thing is um, the packet from our first ever town council meeting, and the reason that that's in there is it has that select board memo from Doug Slaughter that includes the charges to every committee. I couldn't find, for some reason, I couldn't find just that document um, in PDF form of the, of the memo with every single charge attached, but it was in the packet, so I just put the entire packet up there. The second document are discussion questions that I have written out uh, to guide our discussion today. The third document is the Excel spreadsheet that was put together by the Rules Committee um, that ranked committees um, into essentially three different uh, ranks about whether or not they should have uh, liaisons or with the priorities, so priority groups one, two, and three with regard to whether they thought they should have liaisons. I have added two columns onto that document that were not from Rules Committee. Um, one is um, when we were on our retreat, we took, we voted um, on which committees we thought should have liaisons, and so it's the results of those votes. And then also um, we put stickers on which ones we had actually attended because there was some thought that you really shouldn't be deciding that a committee should have a liaison if you've never paid any attention to that committee or been to it. Um, some of them are highlighted in green. Those are ones where we had a majority vote uh, of the council that they should have a liaison. And so if they had seven or more votes, the ones in yellow had uh, three to six votes. And so um, whether that's useful or not, we can talk about later. Uh, the next item in your packet is the uh, draft language from GOL on the role of a liaison. And then the final item in the packet is the, uh, uh, per Darcy's request, April 22nd report from Rules of Procedure um, that included talking about liaisons. I think how I want to start this discussion, even though I didn't 
give her advance notice of this, is given that we have the chair of the Rules of Procedure Committee on our committee, and given that Rules of Procedure spent some time deciding, deciding which uh, committees, uh, or how to rank these, um, it seems appropriate to hear a little bit, and we also have Darcy, who is also on Rules of Procedure, it, it seems appropriate to hear from Rules of Procedure sort of what discussions they had and how they came up with these priority rankings before we have those discussions so that we're not just duplicative. So, Chair Brewer, former Chair Brewer. Well, not being fully prepared to speak to this, um, I'm gonna have to go from memory and then Darcy can correct me the way she remembers it happening. But what I largely remember is working from my experience as select board member for many years, right? So I was on the select board for nearly 12 years and so I had a good sense of what kinds of committees ended up coming to town meeting for mm -hmm. actions, and which means they'd now be coming to the town council for actions, mm -hmm. and what kinds of committees just kind of worked independently, and what kinds of committees we kind of real wished hadn't worked in silos and only told us at the last minute what they were doing, and ones that people had successfully been liaisons to and not successfully. So I had substantial thoughts about how that should work and was pretty strong about those thoughts, one thing that I think came up in those conversations that then led to an exercise we did at the retreat is that it, it seemed to me, based on the conversation we were having at Rules, that many people were very unfamiliar with what those committees actually did on a day-to-day -day basis, and so the sound of them made them think that they maybe needed a liaison, but they didn't actually necessarily have read the charge or have been to any of their meetings or read any of their minutes and really have a sense of what they would do. And so I was pretty strong armed, I, I was pretty strong about, I think it's these. And there were some questions and um, some discussions about whether or not these were the right ones. And then when we got to the retreat, if you'll recall, I pushed that we have, uh, have you ever been to one of these committee meetings? Do you have any sense of what they're doing? And that I think helped us, help people kind of rethink it in their minds, like okay, I know that sounds important. What do they actually do? Where have I actually been? What have I actually heard about? And that's all those charts that you then um, put together for us. So I think this has been an evolving discussion over time. If we had decided to do it right then in the spring, right after rules had happened, I think I would have pushed and potentially been successful at saying it should be at these X committees. But I think now that people have actually had more time to think about it and looked at it at the retreat, and then we revised the rules about what liaisons were, right, which is, has continued to evolve, I think people have somewhat different perceptions now a year in as to what needed a liaison and what a liaison is and what value, given all the meetings we all already go to, mm -hmm. it would be understanding that largely liaisons can be a way of just passing information back and forth without necessarily having to attend a meeting. So, um, yeah, so that's how I've seen that evolving over time associated with that. And one of the other things to bear in mind is, as GOL has probably discovered, with two of you being on GOL, charges for committees, unless they're based on Mass General Law or a bylaw, which not all of them are, um, sometimes don't seem to necessarily have a lot to do with what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> and so, unfortunately, the charge document doesn't really tell you if that's the thing. And so, again, I was going largely on experience of who tended to show up at town meeting needing something, and therefore, we as the select board could have been useful to them as they were facilitating that. And it's entirely possible town council could continue to play that role as we outlined in the rules, serving as that source of information. Oh, maybe they didn't know that this other committee is working on a similar thing. Darcy is a member. Do you want to provide any additional insight into the process behind this? <clears throat> yeah. Um, uh, I have a little memo here that the committee uh, wrote to itself before uh, Alyssa's final report, and uh, it basically uh, pretty much outlines the number one committees as um, being committees that are likely to bring policies to the council, um, but leaving it flexible so that we can come up as, uh, with ideas for other committees other than the ones they listed as number ones. Um, 
the duties we listed in, in the actual rule, and we've been discussing that. And um, as far as the selection process for selecting who of us should be liaisons, uh, they suggested that during a public meeting, present the list and ask for volunteers right in an open meeting, and then where several volunteers, there are several volunteers for one committee, refer to OCA for final recommendations based on discussions with the volunteers. Um, and then an alternative was to draw straws during a council meeting, which is interesting. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and I think the report itself got, got into a whole lot more detail about what we had discussed, but we, you know, discussed it pretty extensively, and as you can see from the list. Mm -hmm. um, also, I have to leave in five minutes, FYI. Okay. We'll still have a quorum soon. Um, okay, so um, if I'm, I'm looking at the discussion questions for liaisons, which you don't necessarily have to open, but essentially I came up with five discussion questions that I think we should answer, we should try and answer um, in our time here today. One is what criteria should determine which town committees or elected bodies should have a liaison, which I think is is what is really what rules dealt with in a lot of ways in which we just heard. Uh, second is which committees meet that criteria. So I think we should start by exactly what Alyssa did, which ones, why do, would we or would we not think a committee should have a liaison and then uh, which meet those criteria. Um, I think a question that I, I put out there, even though I think we probably all agree on the answer, is it important um, that every committee that meets the criteria has a liaison? So if it, you know there are 13 counselors, if we find 16 committees and we say they all meet the criteria, do we have 16 liaisons, which would require a lot? Um, is it important that every counselor also serve as a liaison? And should counselors be allowed to serve as liaisons to multiple committees? I think that questions one and two are really the priority questions that we absolutely need to answer for today. This is already on the January 6th agenda. Um, and so we, we, we do want to bring something to the council. I think questions three through five um, are less important, but we do still need to consider them. So, Alyssa. So would you consider a sixth question? I, I am open, yeah. That can also be in the lower priority. I think it, especially given some recent discussions, it's worth uh, considering the question, even if we decide not to answer it, as to whether or not the president and vice president should be allowed to serve as liaisons. And that reflects back to not only recent discussions about the role of the president and the vice president, but also around the idea that one of the things we always tried so hard to do was to make it sure that the select board was not going in and telling another committee what to do. And when you're the president or the vice president of the council and you show up at somebody else's committee meeting, it, it, it has a weight. Okay. And so it, it should, we should make a conscious decision, it seems like. So I want to start with question one, which is which criteria should determine which town committees or elected bodies should have a liaison. What I heard from Alyssa was sort of what, what, what was pushed in rules was um, it, it, if it is likely that that body will be bringing something before the town council, then it makes sense for them to have a liaison. So some of these bodies sort of act very much in a silo. They don't ever, uh, you know, I'm thinking in my head of, well, I don't want to make judgments about any committees ahead of time. But there are some committees that are allowed to promulgate regulations on which the council never has any influence, say, or vote. Um, and there are other committees that will have to bring their stuff to the council. Um, that seems to me a very logical criteria for whether or not one needs um, a, a liaison. Is there any, uh, do people agree with that? And is there any additional criteria that we feel should be considered? No, is that the only criteria? No, I, I have. Oh, sorry, George, I didn't see your, right. your finger I, there. I, I, my finger is kind of hidden. So, <laughs> um, I had thought about this a little bit, and I, it felt to me that even if it's they're not going to bring a policy, even if the, they can go off and do whatever they want to do by whatever mass general law or whatever it is that allows them to do that, um, 
it seemed to me it would be valuable for the council to, to know what they're up to. Um, now, maybe the argument is, well, just read their minutes or pay attention, and that's not a bad argument, and that might be the right response. Um, but I thought anybody that is regulatory in nature um, should have a liaison. That was just my you know, naive sort of initial thought. And anybody that distributes money, that, that hands out taxpayer dollars, um, should have a liaison. Um, I guess my thinking was not so much that, that we might actually have to act on something they would bring to us, which I agree is absolutely essential. That would definitely be a criterion and maybe the only one that we decide on. But I thought that it would also be helpful for uh, the council to have at least one individual who's um, you know, a liaison to these other kinds of bodies so that um, A, if there was something that needed to be brought before the council just for FYI, they could do that. And B, uh, fellow counselors would have a list and they would know that, say, Ryan uh, is the contact or liaison for Board of Health. And if you just want to know what Board of Health is up to and you don't want to plow through their minutes and blah, 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 you could just reach out to Counselor Ryan or whoever and say, you know, well, what's going on there? Um, so I guess I felt there might be some role for just keeping the council apprised of, of the work of other important bodies, not that all these committees aren't important, but some obviously are <laughs> right, more okay. important than others. So I thought anything that was regulatory in nature, anything that distributed taxpayer dollars, in addition to any, and obviously anybody that would potentially bring a policy for us to actually have to act okay. on. Would so be I'm going to, yeah. I'm only going to cut you off because I know Darcy has to leave and I want to allow her an opportunity to weigh in here. Uh, yeah, I just, I, I just, um, you know, the thought crossed my mind that, you know, we've been operating for one year without liaisons. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess I would just suggest we think about, you know, what, what have we missed by not having liaisons right. in the last year? What has anybody noticed that, <laughs> is there a problem? You know, it kind of makes me wonder whether we need liaisons at all because we didn't have them for the last year. Yeah. But, um, but no, I, I, I see the merit in liaisons, but I think we should think about that. Like, what could we have done better had we had liaisons in the last year? Yeah. I, I, yeah, I think actually, so originally, uh, George originally came in here thinking if they're not gonna actually bring a policy before the town council, they shouldn't have a liaison. But I do think your point is well taken that some of these regulatory bodies that make impactful decisions, we wanna make sure. So obviously Board of Health right now is considering a lot of tobacco regulations that a lot of people in the business community are concerned about. Um, that I'm not sure that all 13 counselors are aware of the, what's happening with that. And certainly they might be interested in that. Um, Board of License Commissioners, I know they just did the common Vic license over? I'm looking to Alyssa because I feel like she'd probably know this more than me. And they did the BYOB regulations, which maybe some counselors were aware of, some weren't, but all of these things impact our local business community, which I think most counselors have an interest in. So my original thought coming in was, well, Board of Health, Board of License Commissioners shouldn't have liaisons because nothing they do ever comes before the council. Well, based on what you said, I think there actually may be some merit in that. I'd be curious to hear Alyssa's perspective. I mean, I think a lot of it is that we, we can have the conversation about what makes the most sense, and then we can talk about what's practical. Right. Yeah. And I think Darcy's point to that was, is also well applies to that as well, is that no matter what GOL proposal changes around our committee structure, if and the council adopts that, we are still all going to be in multiple meetings a week as it is. And so I would never, for example, want somebody to say, oh no, this uh, council committee can't get together at such and such date because I have to go to an AGCOM meeting. It's like, no, you don't. <laughs> like, you have to go to the council thing. And so partly it's maybe not being able to write some of that into the rules, but it's this... Um, feeling toward it, and that's why I was referring to like obtaining the minutes, and in fact, that would encourage some of these bodies, at which I am not picking on any specific ones yet, mm -hmm. um, uh, to like get their minutes done, but to, to, so that we do know that it's happening, right? And so in theory, it could, ha like if you were the, if George was the um, liaison to the Board of Health, and maybe he went to a hearing they had, or maybe he didn't, but he just read the minutes, and he was like, wow, this is a really interesting conversation. I'm just gonna have this added to the next town council packet. 
so that everybody knows. And then if they decide they want to start following it more carefully, then they can. But at least then it's one of those let's not get surprised at the grocery store thing where we say, we have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and like you say, these all do have economic impacts. To be fair, art spending also has economic impacts. Mm -hmm. But I will offend my artist friends when I say the Cultural Council gets state money, which is all of our money, right? It's not come from some magical source, it's all of our <laughs> money. But it makes no difference to the town council whether or not the Cultural Council decides to fund a particular program or a particular sculpture, unless of course it's gonna be in the public way and then we have another conversation. Um, so if, for example, they were working on something that was gonna be in the public way, then we would want to know about it. But just because they get money from the state lottery that they get to do, that they get to distribute, I don't think means that one of us feels some obligation to keep track of what they're doing. Conversely, Board of Health, which technically isn't spending our money except you know taxpayer money um, to do all the inspections, et cetera, that the board has relationship to the staff for, that one is one that tobacco regulations, if there are future marijuana licensing where they interact with Board of License Commissioners, et cetera. That is going to be very interesting. And so we're trying to avoid this whole siloed approach, but yet we can't be going to meetings every five minutes. So I'm not, sh it, it's really hard to figure out where to draw those lines yeah. that you can say, these obviously fall here and these obviously fall there. And we may just have to pick them out based on we can use those criteria to help us decide, but we may find that some square pegs, round holes, all that doesn't really fit. Like you can't just have somebody say, oh, I took the criteria, I made the chart, now we know. There may need to be some flexibility there. And again, the acknowledgement that I think we did put in the rules, even with the revised rules, is that this doesn't obligate the town councilor to go there. Right. George. What if the obligation were simply to read the minutes maybe reach out to a chair if you had questions. Um, and that was the obligation. And the other piece of the obligation was that on somewhat of a regular basis, I don't know, occasionally at least, you would contribute a short, you know, one paragraph or just a very brief description of what's been happening on X. And that would be placed in the council packet in say a folder, you know, or something that just says, you know, liaison reports for this, you know, most recent liaison report. And whether you go to a meeting or not is, is strictly up to you and your energy and time. Um, and obviously, this is points well taken that it never takes precedence over your, your other council duties. You can't say, well, I can't make a GOL or OCO or so whatever because I have to go to uh, you know, a cultural council meeting. Is that, um, I mean, I, obviously, I'm, right now I'm leaning toward a more uh, generous view of where liaison should be put, but I can see the argument for a much, much stricter one and basically saying to me, someone like me, um, well, you know, the minutes are there and you can read them and, you know, it's up to you to find out what's going on. Um, I guess I'm, I'd like to see liaisons play a role in helping us be a little bit more aware of what the town committees and boards are doing. <clears throat> And if we could make that a somewhat, somewhat more formal policy or procedure, um, there'd be no excuse for us, as, as Alyssa said, having one of those uh, supermarket moments because it was, it was there for us to read and see. We just didn't bother to look at it. Um, and so it's on us. So I guess there's the two very different views. I'm just kind of pushing a little bit for the more broader interpretation, but with the thought that what we're really asking people to do is simply you know, on a regular basis, read the minutes of this committee. Um, if you have questions or problems, reach out to the chair. And then at some point on a regular basis, just file something with, uh, so it gets in the, the packet so that counselors who are interested in or trying to keep up to date with what's going on in AGCOM or, or Board of Health or, you know, Conservation Commission or whatever, um, have a brief sort of s description. Um, does that seem like maybe that is too much? I don't know. It certainly means a lot more uh, liaisons than I think some of us would like. I mean, it, it, our liaison rules keep it pretty broad, right? And I think that every counselor's 
going to treat liaisons differently. Yeah. So if I am a liaison to a committee, which I surely hope to avoid, um, <laughs> I, I, I don't have the capacity to go to any more meetings than I, I don't have the capacity to go to the meetings that I currently have to go to, right? So if I, if I am chosen to be a liaison, I am going to be doing what you described, which is I will read the minutes right. when I have time. I will reach out to the chair maybe on occasion, just be like, what, what should I know that you're doing? Right. And when I feel like something important is happening, I will make sure the council is aware of it. I am certain that there are some counselors who will see the liaison role as they are at every single meeting and probably talking during every single one, right? And to, so to some extent, I think we just allow for that flexibility. But your question is, because those two things require very different time commitments, they might influence how many liaison assignments we give. I'm trying to follow what you're saying. Which that, my interpretation was, depending on how we interpret the role of liaison, might influence how many liaisons we decide there are. Because if it's an easy, easy or job, then we feel flexible to have more. But if we actually expect them to go to meetings, maybe we want fewer. Fewer is that what you're saying? I guess I was saying that if we're really only keeping it to those who will bring policies to the council that the council has to act on. I'm guessing that would keep the number fairly small, and that would perhaps eliminate some of the ones that have already been highlighted in green. Again, I may be wrong. Maybe all the greens would correlate with bringing policy to the council the council actually has to act on. Um, so my thought was if we stick to that strict sort of criterion, and that's it, and we don't consider any other criteria, um, that may just by very fact of the matter reduce it to a very relatively small number. And again, as you said, people will do what they're going to do. Some will go to all the meetings, some will go to hardly any meetings, but we would expect at a minimum they would read the minutes and that they would contact, if necessary, the chair, and that occasionally at least they would let us know what's going on. They would give us a heads up in whatever way was appropriate. And um, so I guess my thought was that's one way of looking at it. If you um, have the view that I have, which is well, also I guess it is the idea that it, I think it's important that counselors have a, a get out of their own silos. I mean, we all are in this sort of, you know, we, we have a lot to do, there's no question, but, you know, there's so much going on, um, and you just, it'd be nice if, if you knew that somebody on, on, the, on a body of 13 uh, is, is keeping an eye on X. So if you have a question about Board of Health or whatever, you, you could go to them. Now, the response to that could be, well, just go, you could reach out to the chair yourself, you can read the minutes. So maybe what I'm concerned about is just a matter of people, you know, but given all the pressures on us and given all the demands on our time, if we, we have 13 people here, or, or maybe 12, or maybe 11, if we take out the president and vice president, so say we have 11 people, um, is it asking too much uh, if we agree on a set of bodies um, that we'd like to sort of be, not only because they could bring policies to us, but also because th what they're doing is something that uh, we feel that counselors in general should be somewhat aware of. Um, the other thought I had just as we're talking is, well, maybe we should simply say you can't attend any meetings, that all you can do as a liaison, and all we're asking, not only all we're asking you to do, but all you can do um, is uh, do the minutes and, and reach out to the chair, but um, you are actually not uh, to attend meetings, um, period. Hmm. Alyssa. Good luck with that. No, <laughs> I don't right, disagree right. with you in theory. I'm just right. not sure the council is willing to be controlled to that level. Right. Um, so, because you know, I can never just follow yeah, exactly right. the linear order. I do have to jump around. I am personally thinking toward 11 right now, taking out the president and vice president. Although I would argue that they could be the liaisons to the other elected bodies, like the school committee or the uh, library trustees or the housing authority. And I'm not, sorry, I'm not gonna count the Oliver Smith will elector. It's just not relevant to our work. But then it's more like I'm elected, you're elected kind of thing. And um, also the president should be in close contact with those bodies because of the capital requests associated with the library and school committee anyway. And so that gives them a liaison assignment without giving them a liaison assignment, so to speak. Um, but if we want to call it their official assignment, that's fine with me too. But so that leaves 11 bodies that aren't elected bodies. They're appointed bodies that we think need, that we would feel 
meet the criteria. And I, I just want to, I, I want to try and change our language a little bit. It's not about bringing us policy. It's about bringing us likely actions. And, and, and we could come up with a different word than action. But most committees are never going to bring us a policy. They're either going to bring us a bylaw change or they're going to bring us a funding request. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it's an, an action, uh, not inaction, action, but action. That, that may require action by the town council. Um, and so, you know, that would, that would argue mm -hmm. effectively for like TAC being a yes, but Kanagasaki Sister City Committee being a no. Um, and so if we could come up with 11, I guess would be my idea then because I know I'm mixing the questions together, but right. we could start with trying to see if there are 11 that seem enough the same or does it fall out that after five, the rest are like, yeah, kind of all the same. So maybe 11 because I would like to see people have no more than one mm -hmm. and that that's hard and fast, like you absolutely can't be assigned more than one how much you interpret you're going to go to it versus something versus is up to you. But then the other thing the select board did in order to feel like we were maximizing our compliance with open meeting law is I know you all remember what our agendas looked like at the select board. On the reverse side of the agenda, which was only ever one page, by the way, um, <laughs> on the reverse side of the agenda, and it included an upcoming calendar, on the reverse side, it had a list of all our liaison assignments. And so it had the chart that had the, the names of the committees and with our names next to it so that people would know that in theory, and we posted that as part of our meeting posting, and so then people would know in theory, Doug might be wanting to talk about the particular committee he was at or not. And so what you're saying about having a, play, having a way of reporting out that's, uh, that's written, right, rather than we all know that by the time we get to council reports, it's like 11, 9, 59, and we're going, yeah, we're, that's, we're too tired to even see even said at that point. So, you know, turning it into a paragraph, you know, every two months or mm -hmm. something seems like a totally reasonable thing to do. But if we go ahead, since we already have such long agendas and we've been uploading them as part of our posting, is we could include that list there too. So again, the public would not be like, why are you talking about Conservation Commission? But you still wouldn't say, oh, let, let, let's just talk about master law and reconstitute the conservation. Like, you wouldn't do that because that wasn't a topic yeah. on the agenda, but you could certainly report out about it. But that would also just be a handy place. One of the frustrations I keep running into with any of these discussions is that we don't maintain anywhere in Excel that all of us has that isn't about who got a priority committee assignment or not. It's just who's on everything right, to like remind ourselves, and we did that with rules at one point. We made it, except one of the tabs in the spreadsheet yes. that in our report, mm -hmm. said this is who's doing what yeah. already, because when we come to that, I believe I called it thumb wrestling part, where two people are like, but I wanna do that one. Yeah. It's like, yeah, but you're already on three other committees, <laughs> could I, you chill out? Right. Because I would argue that if somebody has extra capacity, they should not be taking on additional liaison assignments. Mm -hmm. They should be taking on additional town council responsibilities mm -hmm. in town council meetings. Yeah. Um, and, and I will say that spreadsheet was in our packet for today, but then I took it out because we're not talking about people. But I have it in my OCA folder to go back in the packet when we do, although at that point, the, it, it might be completely out of date. Um, I am going to put us on break for three minutes okay. so that I can go to the bathroom. Um, but then when we come back, what I actually want us to, I think we've had enough theoretical discussion. Yes. I want us to actually look at this and, and go through this and actually try to nail down some of the committees. So, back in three. Okay, we're back, so you two can share a computer. I could try and project, although it's not usually very useful. Okay, so if we're looking at this document, there's some interesting things here. So, there are, eight, there are eight uh, bodies that rules had listed as priority one group. Um, of those, when we had our retreat, five of those were voted on by a majority of the town council as they should have a liaison. So 
I want to talk about them, but my sort of knee-jerk reaction is if rules decided that they were the priority group number one, and if a majority of the council voted that they should have a liaison, those might be the easiest to decide whether or not they should have a liaison. And so um, those are highlighted in green in rows two through eight. So why don't we just quickly talk about them? And, and like I said, I think these might be the easy ones. So affordable housing trust. Mm -hmm. To me, makes sense of something liaison because they have already brought two things to us in the past year. Okay, the next one that's in priority group one that a majority of the council selected was the Community Preservation Act Committee. Is there a particular reason? Um, I mean, they are, going to, they are going to be bringing us recommendations, but I mean, they, they have a very public process. It's in, it's in a relatively short period of time each year. I'm less wedded to that one, but I, I agree that I, it should make the top 11. Let's say if I'm still working <laughs> for my 11, yes, okay. it should make the top 11. And so I'm, sure, I'm not sure it make my top three, back to but it's, my t it's definitely in my top 11. Okay, and I know this is one where people have been sort of Councilors have been attending these meetings in, in, in a assumed liaison role. Um, the next one, which was in priority, working group, priority group number one and had a majority vote of the council, but to the best of my understanding, no longer exists, is downtown parking working group. So, th so the way you manage that, because yeah, when I wrote this, they should have already, we should have already disbanded them two years before then, but you know, that was then and this is now. And so they have actually been officially dissolved now. But what the point of this remains is that perhaps other counselors will not share my feelings about this, but I feel incredibly strongly that past town managers who created a purely advisory to the town manager not subject to open meeting law parking commission I found extremely offensive and so it and it included similar representation to what we put on downtown parking working group you know some business owners the chamber now the bid we didn't have the bid back when we had a parking commission but or maybe at the end part of the parking commission but I found it very frustrating that I knew business owners had concerns and Customers had concerns and residents had concerns about parking and they were all being vetted in this internal process that then came to the select board as a, well, we all decided this and it's like, uh, based on what public input, right? Because it's like that was the thing with mm -hmm. Downtown Parking Working Group is that although they had many struggles over the years including maintaining a membership that was consistent, which was frustrating for the members as well, is that they had public meetings and they asked people to come in and talk to them about specific things and it was all a public process as opposed to sitting in a room with staff and a couple of okay. business owners. And so my point in airing that old grievance is that whatever, we, we still need some kind of focus on parking downtown and I think that you know it's all well and good to say we're gonna have with those three priorities, right, that came out of the Downtown Parking Working Group's recommendations to say we're gonna have a staff member that's the, the parking czar. Yeah, well, that's fine, but, and that person needs to be associated as staff with any future parking committee, but there needs to be, I believe, a committee that is focused on this. I'm entirely willing to have that committee be a subcommittee of CRC, for example. Okay as opposed to being a separate thing. In fact, I really don't think it should be a separate thing. I think it should be a town council animal of some kind, whether we okay. call it a parking, town council's parking commission, or we call it CRC's subcommittee, or CRC's ad hoc, or whatever. Okay. What are we gonna call it, CSA? We'll come back. I don't, let's, not, let's not completely so derail. What, so what I'm trying to say is, that is so important to me, and I believe to some other people, that although we can no longer say we're gonna have a liaison to it, 
Mm -hmm. I believe it needs to have council membership on it, as I said back then, for possible member, whatever it is, okay. whatever the parking thing is in the future. So that just needs to be taken into account in terms of numbers of assignments, okay. right? Um, so the next one, and I do have sort of a question that might be for you, Alyssa, on this, um, that has, as priority group one, I had a majority vote, is planning board, parentheses, zoning subcommittee thereof. So there's a planning board, and then there's the zoning subcommittee of the planning board, which meet back to back usually, but uh, they are two separate meetings. My, re my reading of that wording is that this is intended to be the uh, liaison to the zoning subcommittee of the planning board. However, there's no other line for planning board. And so is it, can you? Because everybody's initial glance is planning board. In fact, some town councilors told us later they didn't even know there was a zoning subcommittee at the planning board that was different than the zoning board of appeals. So, you know, people learn. But based on past experiences where a select board that I fought my way onto had been sending individuals to planning board meetings to try and convince them to vote one way or another on a particular application felt really inappropriate to me as a liaison. So that's where my liaison uh, attitude is coming from on some of these things. Mm -hmm. So, but zoning subcommittee made sense from the standpoint of the, of the select board I served on most recently that because they were talking about changes, right, potentially to things, it was nice for the, at that time, select board, to have a clue, because we always had to have a position, even though we didn't have an executive authority on planning, we always had a position to recommend to town meeting, because they figured we were covering, we were like paying more attention over the course of the year than town meeting members necessarily always were. So the zoning subcommittee uh, is like that relationship to CRC, is what I see, given that we have CRC. If we didn't have a CRC, then I, uh, I don't know what to okay. do with that. But that may be, where that relationship is better covered if there's a CRC, if it's somebody perhaps even a CRC member that is doing whatever zoning stuff is the person that's related to that. But the whole point was to avoid the appearance that a town councilor was trying okay. to come in and serve as the and now eighth member of the planning board when they were making legal planning board decisions versus making bylaw recommend change recommendations or new overlay districts, you know, that kind of thing. Right, so my, my, my thought on this is, yeah, the zoning subcommittee is actually gonna be recommending zoning bylaws before the council, so they 100% meet our criteria. The planning board does, nothing they do comes, except for the zoning stuff, comes to the council. They are regulatory, but not in the same way that like Board of Health is regular. They're implementing regulations, they're not promulgating regulations, right? and they're not spending tax permits. So I think by our criteria, the sort of body of the planning board absent the zoning subcommittee doesn't necessarily meet. I'm trying to think about how I'm wording this new report. Right, but I mean, zoning, zoning subcommittee obviously has to have planning board vote on what they decide before it comes to town council. But in terms, and then in terms of how the hearings are gonna be managed and all that jazz for, you know, that's kind of all a work in progress till we sort that out. But yes, I would agree that just like the zoning board of appeals, doesn't belong on this list and isn't on this list. The planning board itself doesn't belong on here, but the zoning subcommittee of the planning board does. And again, not forcing people to go to their meetings and certainly not really encouraging town councilors to go and have input to the bylaws before, yeah. <laughs> beforehand necessarily, but to have that awareness that something's happening, I think is, is valuable because then as a town council, then we can tell people, Oh, the zoning subcommittee is working on this. We just heard about that from Darcy. We know that she told that they're working on right. something associated with that right now. Go to their meetings. And okay, George. This this is interesting to me because it really puts to the test my, you know, original vision of wanting counselors to sort of be aware of what's going on, and so um, that's why I had regulatory in my list. Not I share. Alyssa's concern of, you know, counselors trying to, you know, uh, influence or even give the appearance of influence on those bodies, that's totally inappropriate. Um, 
but, and maybe this is just for me to think about, you know, I don't usually have time to, um, and maybe I just have to make time, but I usually don't have time to uh, review what the planning board is up to, what the zoning board is up to, um, even though it's obviously there in the public record, it's not that hard to find out. Um, and so my original sort of idea was that if you have a liaison, you know, what they do is they kind of, but I don't know, well, maybe this idea is a bad idea. Um, you know, <laughs> at least when I think about these two bodies, um, maybe the answer simply is, you know, if you really uh, care about it and you're doing your job, you need to just take the time and, and look into it, um, especially given the nature of what they do. Um, it may not be appropriate to, uh, to have, li we've already said ZBA is not on this list, and I, don't, I think for good reason, in spite of what I had thought originally. Um, and planning board as well um, really should not be on this list, though the subcommittee does make sense for the reasons you've stated. Uh, it just causes me to rethink my sort of idea. Well, it's important that we have counselors who are sort of like the contact person for X, Y, and Z, but for these two bodies, Planning board and CBA. Hmm. Maybe that's well. I know, but it, it may just say, look at as a counselor, there are going to be certain bodies like these that you're just going to have to uh, do a little homework on your own. Uh, I think there are still some bodies where I think it would be valuable to us to have little reports. I'm just yeah. envisioning a little report in a liaison packet on CBA or planning board. Uh, just that that kind of makes me a little nervous. Uh, so that maybe it should be yeah. so. Think, think then, if we can think about these reports, think of it this way. So, zoning subcommittee of planning board, the little report would be they've decided they're taking up inclusionary zoning again. Yeah. They've decided they're not gonna look at design guidelines yet. I'm That'd hoping this is wrong. Yeah. But um, the, that would be valuable for us to know yeah. that they've made that decision rather than just the absence of us getting it. Doesn't yeah. mean that they aren't working on it in three months. It means they've tabled it for six months. Um, however, Planning board, ZBA, decisions they're making on site plan review or permits. Yes, it's all part of our economic impact, right? And But some of it is just whether or not somebody can build on a flag lot for a house. And while, yes, these things are definitely all connected, does it rise to the level of I mean, all those decisions are on, are on the website? Right. And you can watch and see We've had complaints, for example, many years ago about the way applicants were treated at those meetings mm -hmm. by ZBA and planning board members in terms of the attitude you bring to the table, right? Is it yes and or is it no way, you know, mm -hmm. that you're trying to say to people? Mm -hmm. But you can't get that across in a report anyway. Okay. And so um, while we appoint them, right, which makes us think <laughs> we want to know more about what yeah. they're doing, yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure what a report would look like other than, wow, they're, so they had another meeting that lasted five hours, they got <laughs> two things done, and yeah. they had to extend two other things three more weeks. Yeah. Uh, is yeah. that helping us? Yeah. I don't know. So the first, the first thing I do want to just clarify for you is zone, when we say zoning board of appeals is not on the list, it's not in the priority one list, it is in this document. It is in number three priority and only two counselors voted uh, for having it, so it's not that it wasn't ever put out there. Um, it's in these in these green ones, right? Um, you know, so I, I do want to move on. I think I think my general thought on, on this is we will likely recommend. To me, the zoning subcommittee absolutely should have a liaison. Um, it, it should probably also be a liaison from whatever, who's also a member of whatever committee deals with zoning. But we can talk about that later. Um, planning board. You know, my my thought on this is. Do I need a report that says, so planning board approved the Southeast Street project? Eh, probably not. It's useful, it's interesting to me, especially, you know, but the other, the other thing is the zoning subcommittee to the, is not videotaped, and I'm sure there are minutes, but I've never been able to find them. They, I, if, but legally, they must have minutes. I have never once been able to find, and because they're doing things that I'm really interested in, but planning board, has minutes and it's videotaped, and so every time I'm curious about what they, there's there's access points. That, so, I think there's some argument. Okay, I do want to move on. So, uh, transportation advisory committee had the most number of votes, which was 11, 11 of 13 counselors. So that one to me seems like an easy yes because even if we say no, we have 11 of 13 counselors who are telling us we're wrong. Okay. 
<laughs> um, AgCon. Um, oh, actually, so let, let's do this. So those were all the priority ranking ones that had a majority vote. So actually, what I want to do before I go into the other ones that had a majority vote in two is there were three bodies that did not get a majority vote, even though they had been ranked as, as priority one. And I, I want to talk about them before we go into the two. So they're Amherst Redevelopment Authority, Amherst School Committee, and Jones Library Trustees. No one, not a single counselor, wanted to see a liaison to the library trustees. Only one wanted to see one to the Amherst Redevelopment Authority. Three wanted to see one to the school committee. These are all elected bodies. Um, so before we look at any others, I want to just deal with these. They, they are priority ranking number one from rules, but they have very few counselors who actually wanted to see it. So do we want to, do we think there should be a liaison to any or all of these? That's Again, a, I'm not gonna pretend I remember every word of the conversation, but the sense I recollect from the fact that we included these as priority one is because some members of rules either themselves believed or believed that other town counselors would be very interested in the work of those committees. And so rather than saying they're not a priority and then having people fight about it, they were left on the list. I agree that communication absolutely needs to occur between those bodies and, and that's why my see the pants idea today was that potentially that's a role for our officers to continue because I certainly hope they already are doing that. And if they aren't, then that needs to be something we encourage, whether we call it a liaison assignment or, or not. But again, I'm open to whether or not we call it a liaison assignment and say it's for the officers, because again, we're all elected officials and that puts it on a more level playing field. And then, so it's okay if the town council president calls the Jones Library trustees and it doesn't seem like the town council president's trying to make them do something. Um, because they're on a more level playing field, but if we don't want to call it liaison and we just want to say officers talk to officers, that's great. I, I don't care, but I think that's why they ended up on the list, and I think as we had more conversations about what a liaison does and people realized that they couldn't really like influence those bodies, mm -hmm. um, it would be well much less that. interesting and that we, they weren't gonna like say, well, the town council talked about XYZ associated with the school's project, like that we weren't going to be going and reporting like that out to these things that um, typically, that I think that's why it became of less interest. But I, I don't want to lose sight of them all together because I'm worried about the communication between them. That's absolutely an ongoing challenge. But I see it as an officer's role. So it's either officers as liaisons to only those or don't call them liaisons and just assume that officers will do that and encourage officers strongly to do that. George? I don't think we've had any trouble in communications with the school committee. What are the others again? We have school committee. <laughs> library, library, Jones Library Trustees, and then the Amherst Redevelopment Authority. Redevelopment Authority, we just, right, seems to be not, I mean, it only gets involved when there's actually something for it to do, and uh, lately there hasn't been anything for it to do, is my understanding. So, I, you know, the list I'm That's saying. also a choice on their part. I mean, okay. there's a leadership role to be taken there, and they are in a reactive mode at this point, and that's true. Like everybody, they cycle through things. And the only reason we're having such good communication with schools right now is because of the capital projects. I, I can guarantee you that. Yeah. If we weren't, ha but of course, we're going to have those for the next several years. Yeah, so communication spilled in. But I mean, I, I would hope that, the, you know, the president would say, hey, I met with the school committee chair, and it turns out this is the direction, or they've appointed the building committee. Like, that doesn't necessarily have to be the town yeah. manager reporting that. That could be an officer reporting that. Right. But I don't see just sending a regular counselor to those things. Yeah. And my thought is, for at least for the school committee and the trustees, I mean, between budget coordinating group and JCPC, there's already some collaboration on, on things, so. Okay, so it sounds like no to those three. Okay, so then we can move on to uh, priority group two, um, of which uh, the first one that pops out is agricultural commission as being in the second priority group, but did have a majority of counselors uh, supporting a liaison. I will admit to this group that I have very limited knowledge about what the AgCon does, and so I will defer to 
those of you who are much more familiar with them. And I, I wish we had our, our, yeah. I wish we had Sarah here too. Yeah, it's too bad that she couldn't join us today. The um, is, it, it, you know, like anything else, it ebbs and flows, right? Yeah. And so it might at some point in the future be bringing us something associated with, say, water rates. There have been complex discussions about the way water and sewer works for farming operations, for example. Um, there have been difficult conversations, and again, I'm kind of loath to bring up things that we think we've resolved, but there have been conversations in the past associated with the farmer's market that the Agricultural Commission has been involved in in terms of access to the farmer's market by Amherst farmers, et cetera, that, that could rise to the level of becoming a town council issue because we approve of the use of that parking lot at no charge, as we always have, because we consider it a, a wonderful bonus for the town. Um, so they would be in my you know, second or third cut you know, they're not necessarily in my first cut because I'm seeing Board of Health and, you know, we're, we're kind of on a Board of Health theme here. Right. And Board of License Commissioners, of course, is brand new. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I mean, I, I, would, I would equate them with Conservation Commission and wherever we put AgCom and Conservation Commission to me is fine. But if, if they're like numbers 10, going on my 11 thing, if they're mm -hmm. numbers 10 and 11, I'm fine with that rather than saying they're numbers four and five. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. What a wonderfully complex answer. Yeah. No, it's it's easy. And I think, and I think actually the, the other, it, uh, wow. It makes sense maybe because the other one in part of group two that has a majority of the council is conservation commission, that it does make sense to maybe have these together and George. This is where I guess my argument does to me make a little bit of sense that, that if there were something in our packet every time we had a meeting that was for liaison reports and I just open it up and take a look and I see something from AGCOM or I see something from the Conservation Commission, I would open that up and read it because I normally don't see anything. A, I don't know anything. B, I don't have the time to pay attention, shamefully. Um, whereas with planning board and zoning, I can see a strong case for should at least be paying attention to that. Um, so I think there's a place for this kind of liaison role where, um, you know, wh when appropriate, the liaison would put something in our packet. Um, and also, if you ever did have a question about Conservation Commission, AGCOM, you would know there's a colleague you could go to and yeah. say, you know, well, what's going on? And, and hopefully they would tell you. Um, so I agree with Alyssa that I wouldn't like to see this go completely off the list. Uh, but it would be obviously lower down than, than okay. some of the ones. So I'd like to keep it, but lower down. And can we assume the same? So for both AGCOM and CONCOM? Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to put them as tentative yeses. Yeah. Yes, question mark. And I do, and I will, I, I was going to say that, I will say that the first time I thought about this liaison thing, which was in September, I said, I was not one of those seven votes for CONCOM because I thought of them in the same vein as planning board in that the projects come, they, why do, I don't, I don't need to know that so-and-so got approval for a pesticide, right. to apply pesticide somewhere. And it, but then my opinion did change a little bit in bylaw review committee when we learned that they're going to be making revisions to the wetlands bylaw and I thought, oh, well, if they're actually gonna be in the near future putting forth bylaw revisions that will come to the council, maybe, it, maybe we say a liaison for now, but maybe they don't always need one. So, uh, Alyssa, you were, oh, you had a reaction. I was where historical, thank you. I was wondering where historical commission was on this list and how, in terms of how many votes it got, right? Because I know it's not green, but. Historical commission is in priority group number three and it got one vote. That is so interesting to me because I would equate them at least with AGCOM and Conservation Commission and potentially higher because they are the ones who got who left us with Porta. Now, <laughs> that's not entirely fair because they obviously aren't the ones who own the building or the people who are running the shoddy business in it. But by protecting the old Bertucci okay. as though it was something, I think that that actually does have a big impact on our George, choices you, in the community. You, but I would, I would put them at least with those two rather than leaving them off. George, you seem like you agree? Yes. Okay. So um, that gets us through all of the ones that got majority votes of the council. So AGCOM and CONCOM, which are the last two. 
both of which I thought were interesting got majority votes of the council, but each of them, only one member of the council reported having ever actually been to them. Um, but anyways, so what I want to do now is look at some of the yellow ones in priority group number two, um, and I want to do it in, in the order in which they got votes. So Board of License Commissioners had six votes, so it was not a majority of the council, but it was close. My understanding is from the way George has interpreted regulatory and the way we've talked about it that they might be one that should have yeah. their agreement. And this is a straight yes, not a yes question mark like we put on CONCOM. Yeah. Okay, so I would, I also agree there. So that was easy. Um, so then let's look at uh, Board of Health, which got four votes. No one has ever attended Board of Health, apparently. Um, Yeah, okay. Okay. Gonna do that. Um, How many are we up to now? Yeah. Or do you not wanna say? I don't wanna say. I will give you that when we finish going through these, and then we will figure out which ones we're gonna take out. Um, well, I think Alyssa gets the liaison to any of the committees that she has attended. At, at any of the ones where she is the one person who has ever attended it, that's her committee to attend. Um, so then there's a few that have three, so let's just go through them. Uh, Disability Access Advisory Committee. I'm pretty sure I voted for them. I, you know, I generally would, depending on how many stickers I had. Um, because I have felt that they've been quite siloed, not, you know, by anyone's egregious intent, but it took a very long time for the select board to convince staff that every time we had a request associated with changing a sidewalk or changing um, the way we put out the parking machines, et cetera, mm -hmm. that we check in with Disability Access Advisory Committee first. A lot of what they do day to day has zero to do with us in terms of like they have to, all that construction over at Amherst College, they had to do certain variances, so to speak, as to what they were allowed to do. And it's like, I don't think we need a report that says they were able to do a ramp because the OEP said they could. But um, I feel like they're not included enough in all the conversations we have. So when we talk about which sidewalks are the priority to work on, you know, where around the, around the senior center, for example, where are the, how can people pull up to those little parking kiosks? You know, all those kinds of things in terms of the day-to-day -day decisions that we make. I can understand that, you know, at some point push comes to shove, but I actually consider them, you know, something that we need to integrate more into our decision making, but that can be accomplished by simply continuing to pressure the town manager, mm -hmm. to pressure staff to ensure that we're getting reports from them. Mm -hmm. But if we feel like we can't get it that way, we could have a liaison who then was bringing us the report if we felt like we couldn't get it from, from staff. And I mean, everybody's busy. Nobody's intentionally not telling us stuff. Right. It's just that it doesn't always get included, although we have gotten a lot better about remembering to ask them. George, do you have an opinion on this? Not strong. Um, I, I, I said you're, uh, I think, Alyssa did an excellent Yeah, maybe third tier. The, the other reason I find them important is I think they could be potentially playing a larger role as um, various capital projects get considered, right? Mm -hmm. For example, we have run into the pa problem in the past that even though we have designed what we believe to be an accessible playground, members of DAAC with their real life experiences have not always found, okay. you know, because there's, there's always judgment calls, right? right? Even if you meet the letter of the law, is this really the best way to do it? And so they would they offered very helpful input associated with things like that. And right. so it's also about aging in place, right? We keep having those conversations about being senior friendly. So I think they could be taking on an even larger role. But again, if, if third tier is necessary, that's okay. cool. So I'm gonna put them as a yes for right now, but when we come back, we'll see. Um, the next one that I got three votes in tier two is Human Rights Commission. I personally don't think this needs a liaison. Okay. 
Well, then there we go. Um, uh, next one is Pioneer Valley Transit Authority. I saw that. And that was written before we went around in circles a million times a couple months ago about how the planning board was getting mm -hmm. appointed to PVTA and who had voting rights and right. who was the alternate. And, and it was just like it was blah, 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 so much inside baseball. I don't even really remember. And that so um, that was for Pennsylvania Valley Planning Commission, actually, in that particular case, and then PVTA. Because the thing was, we used to have, the select board used to have a seat on PBTA, right. which like made a difference. I mean, we never got elected president, but it made it, um, John actually got elected president when he was our town manager and we, we delegated it to him. So it, given the importance of PBTA in our community, but again, the question is, since the role is no longer an elected official's role, it used to be the select board who then delegated or, or had Doug go in the last couple of years. Um, since we no longer have that option of sending a town councilor, unless the town manager decided to delegate it to a town councilor, which would be weird. Um, I think it's just that we need to be having the town manager communicate to us what's happening with PBTA. Okay. Uh, the next one is. Is that, sorry, is that both then, both PBTA and PVPC? Actually, yeah. One, two, three, We're leaving two. that to the town manager to be the uh, contact, essentially. Okay. Um, okay. We got zero votes, yeah. Interesting voting patterns here. Um, uh, okay, so that is all of the ones that got uh, more than two votes in priority group rating two. There are three committees in priority group Three that got more than three votes, and I want to go through them now. The first one is the Amherst Housing Authority, which got three votes from counselors. Um, it doesn't make my cut. It doesn't make my cut. It's another elected body. Yeah, I would agree. And it, it fits in with the other elected bodies. Fine. Okay. <laughs> the fine was said in a. I wasn't sure if that was like a. Or it's Friday. Okay, uh, then the next one is the Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee. I feel much in the same way of Cultural Council is this is not town money, and so even though they're spending taxpayer money, it's not, it's our money, but it's not our local dollars, but Maybe people so I'd fight for this one over a bunch of others, but okay. I'd also be willing to let it go. So it depends on what else ends up on our final list. Okay. So I'd put it on a maybe list because I don't think it should be siloed away from the council, even though it has zero to do with the council under the current charter. Um, it used to be that the town manager used to tell the select board, I'm gonna do this. The block grant advisory committee is saying, I should do this. I agree with them, or I, the town manager, agree with them, or I disagree with them, so I'm gonna do this. What do you select board think? Because I get to make the final decision, but you can tell me if you okay. think something. And that way an elected body had a say. Okay. And, and that way all the people who were unhappy with the decision that had been made by Block Grant Advisory or the town manager's interpretation of their decision had a place to go to elected officials for accountability. Okay. Um, it is a lot of money, and the vast majority of it goes to capital projects, many of which are town-based capital projects, like the sidewalk on East Hadley Road. Okay. So, it, you know, like it's a third group, maybe, for me, and I think that it's, a substan it, it's enough of a hot-button issue in town. George. It would be the kind of, pack. I guess right now my test is, if I saw this um, in a council packet, would I open it? And the answer is yes. So okay. I definitely think that it's be useful. And if we can get someone to do it, that would be great. OK. I will concede. Um, and then the last one that got more, they got three or more votes, was the Public Art Commission, which no one has ever been to. But four people thought I should have a liaison. Um, George, you seems like you're saying no. Alyssa? So 
Oh yeah, we're on tape. Um, so Public Art Commission has been really complicated since, well, I mean, it's always been siloed, right? And, and again, right. um, they can get money from the Cultural Council, in theory, and they can access other kinds of grants, too. And so they sometimes have been very siloed, like in terms of making decisions about, um, if any of you remember the delightful portion of the parking garage that has little screens in it that used to have poetry on them. Mm -hmm. um, we've had other installations that again were like, it, you know, well, you're the art people, right? So you decide, but um, to some extent it's also sometimes public way. Where it's gotten really complicated was Percent for Art, right? Percent for Art has been kicking around for, I don't know, what, five years now? And part of the reason that it went so badly at the beginning of the process, which it did, is because there wasn't enough communication in terms of what a liaison could have been helpful to make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't know if some people are, I don't know why it got as many votes as it did. If I had voted for it, which I don't think I did, but what the heck, I don't remember, um, is, is because of that complication, because we don't want to be at loggerheads with each other. We, we want to try and take their expertise and turn it into a thing that'll work well for us. But aside from the weirdness of the current percent for art situation, I'm not really convinced that, okay. you know, other than if they, I mean, if they decide they'd want to do a project down to, on something that we actually have some control over, then great. But if, uh, if it's just something the town manager controls, which is, you know, almost all the things, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter. For example, the electrical boxes that have been painted, yeah. the first set, the select board had final say. Mm -hmm. The second set just happened. Mm -hmm. So, because there's no longer an elected body who has a say over that, so. Okay. All right, so that is, that is all of the committees that got three or more votes. However, because we noted, his, we, we have put historical commission as a probable yes, and it only got one vote, I don't want to just not look at these. So as much as this is going to be weird, I want to, as quickly as we can, do a quick yes, no of the remaining ones. And of course, we can have discussions about them, but I'm hoping that some of them will be quick. So Amherst Media Board of Directors. No. no. Personnel Board. Ranked Choice Voting Commission. No. Emma Wilson? No. This is a weird one because their proposal will come right. to the council at some right. point, but I, okay. But, when no. it comes, it comes. but, but once, because we jointly appointed them, mm -hmm. or, or, yeah, we yep. did that with them too. Um, it makes sense that they're, um, one assumes they're kind of talking to us anyway. Like this isn't mm -hmm. gonna be a big secret that they're gonna go work on for six years and then tell us at right. the end, right? They're gonna have intermediate reports and okay. stuff, so I don't feel like we need to do that. Okay. Uh, Amherst Center Recreation Working Group. No. I would put this in as another plug for town manager needs to be responsible to report back out to us, just like with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission okay. and PVTA, and he could maybe just add a new section, like almost like a liaison section to his report. Okay. Board of Assessors. Mm -mm. They're making individual decisions on right. people's property. Council on Aging. I would say yes. So at least this would be a packet that if it showed up in if it showed up as a liaison in the liaison packet, I would open it and see. Okay, what's going on? Given again, yeah. this is apparently my data air our old dirty laundry. But given the reaction that the Council on Aging had to the health center being built coming as a complete surprise to some people, mm -hmm. um, that it's, and given that they do have desires on a long-term capital project, and given that we do have an aging population, and we have yep. the new Amherst Neighbors group working together, and of course the Senior Center is separate from the Council on Aging, although mostly you can't tell by looking at it, um, it seems worth keeping a hand in if somebody would okay. report, yeah. So is this a, Hard yes or a yes in the same way that some of these were like, eh. If we have the body, yes. Soft yes. Okay. Soft yes. Uh, cultural council. No. No. Oh, hold on. I got all messed up. Design review board. Okay. DARPA task force. Absolutely. <laughs> 
uh, at DPW Fire Station Advisory. Doesn't e doesn't exist right now. Um, uh, EDIC. <laughs> Uh, Hampshire Regional Emergency Planning Committee. Local Historic District Commission. Uh, ah. That's a local district. Let the, uh, the, the, uh, the local district uh, reps do that. You're, you're, that's you and me, George, right? <laughs> the peak threat, the reps that they are. Okay. Okay. Uh, LSSC Commission. Why not? Okay. Tell me why. Yeah, you tell me why first. <laughs> Maybe I should tell you why first. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that is a fair question, actually. Or we can come back to it. We can, we can fight about it then. I mean, it's, it, I guess my thought is that it's something that impacts the community at large. Um, it's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, many of our residents uh, make use of the programs, their kids, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it may turn out that based on Alyssa's experience over the years, it's really, you know, not something you need to be keeping apprised of every month or every other month. Uh, I guess I just, I say yes because I consider it something that, that's a, a major actor in the community, involves a lot of our uh, community members, and so uh, it'd be nice to know what's, what they're up to. I'm happy to put it as a soft yes. Soft yes? We okay. will put it as a soft yes. Um, Munson Memorial Building Trustees. We are laughing at Munson Memorial. No, we're not. We don't care. It's okay. fine. They're doing fine. Public Shade Tree Committee. I think that was another problematic thing at one point, but I don't think that we need to assume that that will remain problematic. Okay. George? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, Recycling Refuse Management Committee, I don't think it exists it anymore. Exists. It might be good if it did. There's been some confusion about I, that. I think that's an add to the town manager report thing. Okay. Because whatever work they would or would not be doing, and there right. is that solid waste plan just hanging out there. Right. There's um, some confusion about we need, whether We need to be apprised as to like okay. what is going to happen in the okay. future. But until there's a functioning committee again, okay. I'm not sure we can. Uh, Registrar of Voters. Kanagasaki Sister City. La Paz Centro Sister City. Nope. Water Supply Protection Committee. No. Wayfinding Internal Working Group. Uh, if there was one, yes. Yeah. No, but if there was one, it could get back to me later. Get that screwed up. If, if there was one, I would want, I'd be fine with it being the president, I would want some counselor to know what was going on with it because okay. it's those big signs all around downtown that we Are you the all one the vote that voted for this? Right. And so I'd put, I just put it under the town manager reporting okay. stuff for now. And uh, Zoning Board of Appeals, it sounds like we already came to a decision. Um, and then the others, I think we can ignore. So at this point, if you include our definite yeses and our yeses, <laughs> Uh, we're at 13. Okay. Of those, six are definite yeses. Okay. So our definite yeses are the Affordable Housing Trust, the Community Preservation Act Committee, the Zoning Board, uh, I'm sorry, the Zoning Subcommittee of the Planning Board, uh, Transportation Advisory Committee, Board of Health, and Board of License Commissioners. Those are our six definite yeses. So we are running out of time, but I do want to have a recommendation for the council by the sixth because it is on the agenda. Um, and I don't want to spend too much time on the six talking about this. So I'm going to, so that means there are seven maybes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay. <laughs> I color coded them. Okay, so let's try to have a, hopefully a quick discussion of this. I'm, I'm gonna tell you. Agricultural Commission. CONCOM, Disability Access Advisory Committee, uh, Community Development Block Grant Committee, the Council on Aging, the Historical Commission, and the LSSC Commission. I don't, yeah, I don't personally care how many we have, um, but I do think that 13 is a lot. 13's a lot, and do we feel like 
because I'm not planning to have anybody have more than one. So then the question is, are we, then we'd be forcing the president and vice president to have one. So I think, I'm not personally opposed to the president and vice president um, serving as a liaison, if, especially if they just treat it in the sense of we collect minutes and report out. I, I'm sorry I interrupt you, Evan, but um, it does seem like the president's duties are so onerous that adding this to their duties just seems yeah. crazy. So, so what, I'm gonna, what I was yeah. saying was I, I am not in principle opposed to the president because she is the president having the ability to be a liaison. However, I don't necessarily know that the president wants to be a, a liaison. Um, so, so let's just, I mean, may, do we wanna just take a, a very quick survey of these again and make sure we still agree? We have AGCOM, CONCOM, Disability Access, um, Community Development Block Grant, Council on Aging, uh, Historical Commission, and LSSC Commission. Are there any of those that we feel like rise above the others. George? I'll take a stab at it. Um, Council of Aging, Council on Aging, given some of our, you know, it, just the situation the community's in, that seems to be higher up. Um, obviously, I feel LSSC would also be there, but that's, um, I would think community block grant could be, could be set aside, because um, that's something one can get information on, I think, um, on one's own. It's kind of like ZBA and planning board, it's, it's you know, it's, it's not that hard, and, uh, but I, I guess siloing is something I'm concerned about. I, I heard that with Alyssa with disability, this, it might be worth putting disability on there because of the silo concern. Council on Aging, maybe AGCOM, maybe from the point of view of, of trying to, uh, there are certain bodies that have tended to be sort of uh, left off outside of the main uh, drag and, and we could put them on or put them at a higher level for that reason. Block grant maybe given the fact that, you know, you can find that out, it's not, not that difficult. Um, is there another one um, that could palm that? I don't know. Is anybody by the argument of, of siloing that, that one criteria would be um, concern about certain entities that are just, they're often lost in the, in the yeah. shuffle and we'd like to see if that, that, that not happen? So I think that I understand the rationale behind that. My personal opinion is probably there are other ways to accomplish that. And so my immediate thought is we're about to adopt town manager goals. And you could even write, I mean, if you want specific measurable goals and you could write into them, we want updates on disability. We, we feel like these are committees that are siloed and we don't get information from them. So we're not just, instead of saying a blanketed like, better communication about what town committees are doing, we can literally say as one of your, as his goals, we want, consistent updates, especially from these committees. Um, or we can, we can give feedback to him that we don't see these popping up in the town manager report with the frequency we like and we want. I, I just wonder if, it's, if siloing alone is a reason to give a liaison as opposed to exploring some of these alternative approaches. From that standpoint, mm -hmm. I mean, there are a couple I could, I mean, I could argue back on and off um, all of these. I'm, just not entirely convinced that block grant doesn't stick out as a sore spot. I think amongst this group, mm -hmm. I could let that go. Even though it's a substantial amount of money, even though it's off in town projects, I think the fact that it is, a, it is so closely tied to the town manager that he, we should just ask him to report out to us what's happening with it. He can tell us they're about, they've already done a call for requests on social service agency. Um, now they're ha having the deadline for this. He can just report that to us. Mm -hmm. He can be our liaison for that group, I think, in a way that's different because they're not going to come to us to change a bylaw or ask for money. And so going back to that sort of action aspect of things, 
I'm more partial because of my old experiences. I'm kind of keeping BAAC and Council on Aging part of that whole age-friendly community mm -hmm. accessibility mm -hmm. thing. I'm kind of keeping them on the same level at that point. And so then I'm worried about, and, and in fact, there wasn't a lot of talk about a senior center at least 10 years from now. Yes, she said at least 10 years from now. Um, mm -hmm. Then perhaps I wouldn't even include them mm -hmm. on this list. Mm -hmm. But given that they are concerned that we're overlooking senior concerns, okay. I would tend to, yeah, if I had to drop off this list, I'd drop Block Grant. Mm -hmm. Can you find another one? I, 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 well, my, so I might have a slightly different interpretation of these because I, I think you all are trying to say it, how do we get this list down to 11 so each counselor has one, whereas I said at the very beginning of this meeting, I don't want any, so my, my mindset might be slightly different on, on these, and honestly, I would, I would personally, if this was a hundred, if I was an authoritarian chair of this committee, which some might accuse me of, um, I've been accused of it. Um, I would keep AGCOM and CONCOM and drop the rest, personally, because I think all of the rest are things that I would, I don't, I, I think it'd be great if we had more information on, but I personally don't think rise to the level of needing an assigned council liaison. I'm willing to cede that position, but, you know, if you're asking my opinion, I'm, I'm on the opposite end. Why drop historical? Yes, I, I, will, I would love to do that. So you know where it comes from is I don't have a full understanding of what historical does, enough to be able to say that they need a liaison. And while I have disagreed with many of their decisions, I, I don't envision, in, in the same way that I might disagree with the ZBA decision, I don't necessarily, do we get stuff from them? I mean, like I said, like CONCOM, I probably would take off the list if not for the fact that I know they're about to revise wetland regulations and AGCOM does send stuff to us on, a, you know, so I'm willing to cede this because I, I, I'm speaking from, no one watches these, I'm speaking from a place of ignorance on a lot of these. As I, I really, I've never been to a historical commission. I only read about them in the paper when they make a d d decision that people don't like. So. I don't, so I'm willing, to, you know, I'm, I, in a lot of ways I'm deferring to your experience, but that is why. So under those conditions, I would actually probably drop Historical Commission, CONCOM, and AGCOM, all hmm. three, and say that they're enough more like ZBA, or like yeah. the day-to-day -day functioning of the planning board, that since we're aware that CONCOM's talking about bylaw, it would be very foolish of them to not invite some of us to be part of their conversations before they get too far down the road. But um, I would tend to drop all three of those okay. before I dropped anything else. And I would be, I mean, again, if we were all making our own brackets, so to right. speak, <laughs> I would drop those three and many people will not feel the same way I do about DAAC and yeah. Council on Aging because I tend to, I, I'm lumping them together. And then leisure services, in some ways, I'm kind of lumping with them as well because it's, again, you know, serving various portions of our community that are not always fully interacting with I'm each sure. other yeah. in a way. George. So what I'm seeing here is maybe just disabilities, COA, and LSSC, and everyone else gets, gets jettisoned. I could live with that. Can you, can you repeat those, George? Um, that the only three from this list that would um, be yeses that we would uh, expect liaisons to be appointed would be the Disabilities, Council on Aging, and LSSE. And so that would drop Historical Commission, that would drop Community Development Block Grant, and that would drop AGCOM and CONCOM? That's correct. And that leaves us with nine. Right. Now, that makes Evan happy. Um, and it can make me relatively happy if I can be convinced, as I think I can be, that uh, like ZBA and planning, at least with AGCOM and CONCOM, um, we don't have to worry about siloing, um, or we don't have to worry that much about siloing, and we don't have to worry too much about being kept in the loop. Uh, my concern, again, my argument has been that um, 
trying to keep counselors in the loop, keep them aware of what's going on in outside of our own little counselor world. Um, if we get little reports occasionally, that is very useful, at least to me, I think. Um, so is the sense that with AgCom and ComCom, at least, um, we would get, we wouldn't be out of the loop. And that's what I'm hearing from Alyssa. Um, and um, yeah. so I can live with this, these three. What I was gonna say is I think that we can, I, it'd be nice to get those reports. The question is just, do we ask a counselor to provide those reports to the town manager? And to me, they don't rise to a level of that requiring a counselor to give reports, but we couldn't express to the town manager. We want more regular reports. I also do want to say, because you said that will make Evan happy, we're only three people here and you two outnumber me, so you don't have to make me happy if you disagree with me. You can just outvote me. One always likes to make the chair happy. <laughs> it's, it's just a, a, just a wise strategy. Um, so anyway, it looks like those three would be what's left and there are reasonable arguments for eliminating the others. Um, okay. And the strongest case here is that we are truly trying to keep this to a maximum of one liaison appointment for any given counselor. Okay. And if we're short a few, that's quite okay. Alyssa? That is, and I think that you know when, we, when you so helpfully write this report on our behalf, um, we can make it clear that we very much are looking for more information from the town manager on a regular basis on these various appointed bodies that he makes, because now he makes all of them, right? Mm -hmm. Select board used to do some of these, but he does all of them now. And so that could be once a month, once every two months, once a quarter, I don't care. I mean, like I'm not particularly beholden to a particular thing, but I think it is entirely reasonable that he or a staff member he assigns could write a little report yeah, that's yeah. two sentences yeah. about what each of those committees is doing. And then as things ebb and flow, right? Like we talked about a little bit, like associated with public art, when, percent for, when, when they weren't doing percent for art, like whatever, man, just keep doing your stuff, that's awesome. Um, but percent for art became a big thing where we had to work with them. Other committees may find that in the future, like ConCom, if they do if they do wetlands, like we'll have to work more closely with them. But these are groups that I feel like I can argue the the three that we kept that we're hearing from in isolation and that we know serve significant segments of our population, mm -hmm. and that we are trying to better integrate into our decision making and into our thought process. Okay. And that's why, given that we don't have unlimited time keep track of all these people, mm -hmm. that we that those would be ideal to keep track of. Okay, so we are eight minutes over time, so I do wanna start to bring this to a close. Um, so at this point, there are uh, nine committees that we are, or nine multiple member bodies that we are recommending the town council appoint liaisons to. They are the Affordable Housing Trust, the Community Preservation Act Committee, the Zoning Subcommittee of the Planning Board, the Transportation Advisory Committee, the Board of Health, the Board of License Commissioners, the Disability Access Advisory Committee, the Council on Aging, and the LSSC Commission. Did I, is, that, is that how everyone remembers this conversation? Okay, so then I would entertain a motion to recommend that the Council appoint liaisons to these nine committees that I just named. I would make that motion. Do I have to repeat it? No, I'll write it out. Um, uh, okay, George is moved. That we recommend to the town council that um, these nine bodies um, be given liaisons. I will second that. Any further discussion? We just like our report to reflect the, uh, our emphasis again on the aspect of rules that said you don't have to go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, I, I'll, I'll. Okay, so with that, all those in favor, raise your hand, say aye. Aye. Aye, okay, that is three to zero with two absent. There is one other item on our agenda, but we are already 10 minutes over time and it was under, there's no public comment because there's no public present. Say that for the sense of the video. Um, which is the January meeting schedule. Actually, there's two things on our agenda. Um, so that's fun. So the January meeting schedule, um, I didn't get around to actually putting it up until 
yesterday, um, so you haven't really had enough time to look at it. We can discuss it more uh, later on, but I have our next meeting scheduled for January 6th. I know we're not at a full committee, um, but is that okay with people? Ne next meeting, January 6th? Yes. You're okay with that? Does that work for people? Well, I, I put this up last night. Right. Possibly no one's looked at this. Oh. I've been taught, I've, I've mentioned before January 6th, but channel. I want to make, okay, it's already, I want to make sure people, okay. And so if, if for the January 6th meeting, you can just take a look at this proposed OCA schedule. Um, I only put January and February in because I didn't want to spend what could be considerable effort doing a year long schedule if there is some reshuffling of committees or committee membership. Um, so I only planned through through February. Um, so if you could look at those for the next meeting, but we're in agreement that January 6th will be our next meeting at nine at our normal time, 9.30. Um, the last item on the agenda, which we can choose not to discuss is, uh, as we are aware, GOL is recommending, it, GOL is moving forward with consideration of a committee restructuring. Um, every, uh, the other finance and CRC and GOL have had an opportunity to discuss the implications of that restructuring for that committee. This committee has not yet had an opportunity to, and that might be important for this committee because the restructuring would involve the dissolution of this committee. Um, however, while I do won't think it's useful for us to talk about it, uh, I'm not sure that doing so without the full committee president is present is useful um, because George and I serve on GOL, and so basically the conversation would be, so, so Alyssa, as the one member who's not on GOL, um, and so uh, this is something that I would like us to discuss on January 6th before the council discussion on January 6th, because I think OCA should have a response to that, but it doesn't make sense to, for OCA to try to put that together with two members absent. Um, so I will hold that until January 6th. So. Alyssa. I agree that we need to have the conversation as a full, but in terms of me understanding what were you thinking is my question, because I don't, I totally get, well, I don't agree with the CRC proposal either, but I get the idea of a lot of things ending up under GOL, like that happened with rules and bylaw and stuff. I don't, so are we saying, are you envisioning then that, for example, under our current process, that OCA would be not, I mean, it would be gone, so therefore just the people who are on GOL would be the interview committee, and I'm not sure I'm groovy with that, and I think part of it is because we haven't gotten to the point, and we may never get to the point because of ad hoc and working groups and blah, 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 of having a council committee that then has sort of a, an arm or a subcommittee that does a thing, and uh, I'm not in, I don't know. And so, just like, what were your, th you're just like, fine, it's fine that GOL does all GOL things and also does interviews because we're at, is the thinking that because we're at the point where we are in the process that we've established enough of a process that yeah, I can we can that. slot any of us in or what's the? Yeah, I mean, so I think, I think the basis of this came from there's an inequitable distribution of workload across committees because CRC's charge is so expansive and they're underwater and probably are covering too much. And so a lot of this came from, is there a way to split up the CRC and shift some of, some of their responsibilities to another committee where it would logically fit? Um, and one of the things that came out of that was that uh, OCA perhaps has some capacity, but it, it didn't necessarily make sense to just take some stuff from CRC and sprinkle into OCA and be like, this is OCA plus public ways or something like that. Um, where my thought process came down was the reason that OCA exists as it exists was act actually something I said in the, Jan in the December 10th debate, which was originally outreach and appointments were in separate committees in the original proposal from the president. Um, and I said, well, if part of outreach is recruiting people for committees, shouldn't these be paired? And so we ended up with OCA. Looking back on our past year, our outreach has never done anything with recruitment. And recently at, a, at the last outreach subcommittee, which meets sporadically, um, 
we said, so what does it mean to be the outreach subcommittee? What is the outreach that OCA does? And we specifically had the discussion of, do we see recruitment for committees, including the ones that the town council appoints as part of our charge? And every member of the subcommittee said, no, CPOs are focused on recruitment. We can debate you know, how they do it or whatnot, but we don't want to duplicate their efforts. And so we're going to focus on different types of outreach, like participation of the council. So when I was looking at how to redistribute some responsibilities to help spread out CRC's job, um, I looked at OCA and I said, if the only reason we ever paired appointments and outreach was because part of outreach might be recruitment, but this committee has decided that outreach is not equal recruitment, then there's no real logical reason to pair outreach communications and appointments. And if that disintegrate, if that connection disintegrates, appointments seems like it logically fits with the court, an organization, a committee that deals with organization and governance, right? Um, because I think a lot of the stuff, the conversation we're having, like, well, should counselors be allowed to have more than one liaison rule, role? Should the president and vice president be allowed to serve as liaisons? Actually sound like conversations that probably should be happening in GOL. Um, then it actually made sense that GOL became the place for appointments and then that freed up a lot of room in then it just leaves outreach, and that was the, that's how I cobbled together this new committee. The, th the question then became, GOL already has a full responsibility. Is adding appointments onto that too much? And my thought was, most of what this committee has done for the past actual year has been figuring out process and how we evaluate a appointments, both ours and also, I mean, we spent lots of meetings just talking about, so we get these memos from the town manager, what are we looking for? And I think we're finally at, at where we figured that out. And so appointments can start going a lot smoother. And so I don't personally, and I could be proven dramatically wrong, I don't think appointments is as big a, or as big of a time suck going forward because this committee has worked out some of the, assuming it works, we haven't tested this one yet, but assuming this process works, and assuming that we have, we should probably write it down, like this is how we evaluate, take some of the stuff from our reports and actually write, this is how we look at, if all it is is implementing all of the stuff that we've spent a year building, um, then, then we can just pass that on to a different committee. So you might disagree with it, but that was my pro thought process. Could I just add two thoughts to that then? Uh, as, you certainly Because can. then as we're all thinking about this in all our spare time, we'll talk about <laughs> it again is one that, uh, like I said, I, don't, I didn't like the proposed CRC split. I would almost argue the zoning section of it actually belongs in GOL then, rather than hmm. in some completely separate thing. Okay. And again, obviously GOL has a big workload, but in terms of rethinking how some things might work, because then having zoning and the appointments to zoning kind of might make some more sense to have together, because if there's going to be something focused on zoning, then you know, no longer would it be OCA's job to have written the zoning and planning board and finance committee profiles, right? It would be the zoning group, so it just, but anyway, so something to think about. The other part of it is I'm worried about the timing of this because I can appreciate that, you know, like every year, right, we're supposed to, to look at this, and it's true that some of our original committees didn't, in fact, all of our original committees did not come out of any town council discussion. They okay. came out of the back of a napkin, and we kind of said, sure, I guess. So, <laughs> you know, so we got, so I, I can appreciate that we are totally at a point of need to reevaluate that. What One thing I am leery of, of course, is that we just set up this process. We haven't actually used it this way yet. And if this changes in January, and there's a different group of five, they don't get to change it. <laughs> like, so, like, I'm so, not good with that. So I brought that up in, in GOL, and essentially the president, as she announced this last meeting, has continued current committee membership indefinitely, even though they're one year, she's continuing them. And I, and I actually brought this up. I said, because I was sort of the person that, I've been in a very weird position of being the person who, in GOL, is advocating for the dissolution of the committee I chair, um, which has been incredibly awkward and anxiety-inducing. Um, but... Uh, but I brought that up and I said, it, we're mid-process and so um, the conversation that occurred with, uh, within GOL, and I've also mentioned it to the 
president was, if we do move forward with this committee restructuring, we can vote on it whenever, but it has to have an effective date that is after we do planning board appointments. And every and there was within GOL and with the president, there was universal agreement that we would not just all, a schedule planning board interviews for like first week in February, and then the last week in January be like that committee doesn't exist anymore. Because also, I think the other thing is we have OCA. If we do move forward with this, OCA is written to the rules. I mean, there's a lot of things that have to be done that are gonna take a little bit of time. So even if we vote to do this restructuring, the effective date would probably be sometime later. Oh. George. If we were able to finally agree on a process that we were satisfied with, as imperfect as it may be. Which we have done. Well, we hope we have done. It seems like the appointments could not, they don't necessarily have to be in a single body, right? Is that what I'm hearing you suggesting? that? that one council committee could do appointments for one body and one could do it for another, depending on whether it fell under their purview. So if you were to put, uh, you know, under GOL has legislation, bylaws, including zoning, um, GOL would do the appointment for the ZBA, whereas the one of the body, I guess it would be CRC, at least under this, what we're imagining, anyway, under their purview uh, is planning and, you know, master plan and so forth. Um, is that something that you're thinking of? In other words, they would do the appointment for the planning board, um, or is that gonna, is that, you know? No, I'm sorry, what my mixed up saying was about was in regards to the incredibly brief read I gave of, of the part about the CRC and, and splitting off maybe right. into some separate zoning stuff, which made me uncomfortable in the first place, because the whole point of this is, even though it's all kitchen sink, then but it's all related to each other, and yada, 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 and who does what first, is, if they're going to have, if there's going to be a separate zoning group if that's either part of CRC or is its own entity, mm -hmm. then, or it's either a child of or its own entity, then it seems like it might not be working well with GOL in terms of the process that we've used so far in terms of us providing, for example, the planning document, the, the ZBA document. But given that, then I was saying, ooh, because I'm, literally randomly stringing this together, that maybe it makes sense that GO, if there's gonna need to be this separate body about zoning, is it its own separate body? Is it a subset of CRC? Or is it in fact a subset of GOL because GOL is gonna do the appointments to those bodies? I don't know. I mean, I think there are options here that are, you know, some are fairly terrible maybe and some, some are pretty good and we don't know what the best route is, but I was mainly concerned about that transition period and that this isn't going to be subject to suddenly like, no. oh yeah, I know you guys put a year into that. But yeah, whatever. no, the, those conversations have, have happened. Cause I was concerned, cause it's not, I mean, even like I've had now communications with the applicants. So it's not even like you'd be like, well, you could just give the process to someone else. It's like, well, so um, anyways, um, so I'm gonna, again, because two members of our committee were absent, I'm gonna put this on the agenda for the sixth. I think by that time, uh, not I think, we will by that time actually have the recommended committee charges for the revised committees that I can also put in our packet so we can actually have something in, in front of us. Um, okay, so with that, I'm going to adjourn us at 1.23 p.m.